Today for episode 200, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jeff Freeman, president and CEO of the US Travel Association. You're in for an amazing conversation. You're going to see what leadership is, the clarity of what he's talking about and how he's talking about it and using data. Absolutely phenomenal. Enjoy the conversation with Jeff Freeman. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. Actually, episode 200. And I'm absolutely delighted to have for this episode a legend in our industry, the president and CEO of U.S. Travel Association, the one and only Jeff Freeman. Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Eric, I've been back to U.S. Travel for 14 months. I don't think I can be a legend yet. And we, we've got to figure out what the definition of a legend is because it's certainly not me. Well, uh, at least if I ask your children, they, they might agree with me. But if I look at your resume and everything you've done in your life and uh, uh, you've been at, at U.S. Travel before, but uh, I'm not. I'm not going to speak for you. I'm just going to ask you to tell a little bit about your journey and and how you you get to what you're doing today. No, I appreciate that. I'm glad to be here, and congratulations on 200 podcasts. I've been in Washington for uh, 20, 26 years at this point, and most of that time I've spent working for various industry organizations: the health insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry the travel industry, and many others. And you learn working for these industries that it's often less about the specifics of the industry and more about uh, knowing how to coalesce an industry, knowing how to find common cause, knowing how to separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of what's really most important here uh, for us to focus on, and then how to go get things done. And, and we've had the opportunity to learn those skills in a variety of different uh, organizations. But it was, as you mentioned, it was U.S. Travel or the Travel Industry Association that I joined in 2006 that was most formative for me. I came in a couple of years, obviously, after 9-11. Uh, Jay Rizzullo, then the president and CEO of Disney Parks and Resorts, was the chairman of uh, TIA at the time. And he had this great vision for what the industry could do to get out there and play offense, to go create a marketing program to encourage people to come to the United States. We were the only developed nation in the world that didn't do that, uh, to put the industry and the association on the map. And it was a great opportunity for me to come in in 2006 and help take this industry to new heights, to work alongside Roger Dow, who gave me the freedom to spread my wings and, and do what I did, which was different than what he did. And together we made a, a great partnership uh, and it was because of the success we had at U.S. Travel, creating Brand USA, creating TSA PreCheck, responding and galvanizing the meetings industry when President Obama said, I don't want to see you going off to Las Vegas back in 2009. It was all of those accomplishments that gave me an opportunity to leave, to go and take over the helm of the American Gaming Association, which represents the U.S. casino industry. There, we got to play more offense. We went and removed the federal ban on sports betting. So now all those ads you see on TV encouraging you to bet on sports, that's that's my fault. But it was a great opportunity to play offense and, and reposition the industry. Left to go on to the consumer packaged goods industry and help that industry navigate uh, the pandemic, which was a remarkable experience. And then the opportunity I've always wanted, which was to come back to U.S. travel, to be in an industry that I love, to be around people that I love. Uh, to to help this industry write its next chapter. I couldn't be more happy to be at U.S. Travel. I'm excited about the future. I think we are only skimming the surface, and I'm sure we'll get into it throughout this podcast, mm -hmm. only skimming the surface in terms of the ways that we can represent the industry, the agenda that the industry can embrace, and the things that we can go get done over the next five to 10 years. What I thought fascinating in your journey, and it's all the achievement you have, and I always believe that you have three options in life, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And you always look at, there's a challenge, uh, I'm going to tackle it and find a solution and leave with that. How did the TSA PreCheck program came about and wh what was the issue? What did you see and, and what did you uh, do so that we, we have now this program that uh, obviously is helping a lot of people to, to travel and pass security faster? Well, I like how you put it, lead, follow, or get out of the way. Uh, my experience, and I it, I don't know if it's a hubris, if it's a naivete or what it is, but I guess the, the only approach I know is let's go get stuff done. Uh, let's not be passive. Let's not sit on our heels. Let's not assume that somebody else is going to do this. 
let's go do what everybody else says can't be done. I mentioned the creation of Brand USA, but we went out to create that. Everybody, including some of the most prominent leaders in the travel industry, told us there was no way it was going to happen. And here we are now, Brand USA is in year 12 or 13, spending $200 million a year to encourage people to come to the United States. Uh, by all accounts, it's been a success. There's a, Maybe it's a little bit of both, hubris and naivete, when it comes to some of these initiatives. And PreCheck is a great example of that. If you go back to 2010 or so, uh, we had long lines at the TSA checkpoint. We had an experience that was remarkably frustrating. And we had a lot of people looking left, looking right, and saying to one another, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I think common sense told all of us, there's got to be a better way to do this. You know, Nine years after 9-11, we were treating everybody the same, from the 75-year-old grandmother to the business traveler who's on the road every single week to the individual who's going to Disney World one time a year. We were treating everybody the same. It just didn't make any sense. And proving that it didn't make any sense was another program that we had for Americans coming back into the United States called Global Entry. You know, global entry was a program that said to American travelers, give us more information about yourselves, and in exchange for that, we'll give you a better entry experience. Well, that was really the motto that went with us as we thought about how do we create a better TSA experience. The first thing we did was recognize that we as the travel industry, we're not going to be able to do anything on our own. Uh, we need to surround ourselves with surround ourselves with respected partners. We retained Tom Ridge, who was the first Secretary of Homeland Security. We retained a number of other experts in security to work with us to create a blueprint mm -hmm. for a better way of doing the TSA checkpoint process. So while Secretary Ridge and others spent the better part of a year mapping out what a different system would look like, we complemented that with a lot of research, with a lot of communications that proved the inadequacy of the current system. We demonstrated how business travelers were avoiding 1.6 trips per year because of the hassle factors associated with the TSA checkpoint. Mm -hmm. Well, you take that 1.6 and you multiply that by 100 million travelers, and all of a sudden you realize we had a real problem here. Uh, we talked to travelers at the checkpoint to get their thoughts their point of view on what was going on. We highlighted the failures of the, the current system, the things that were getting through the system because, because um, the, the TSA officials didn't have time to focus on those who were really the threat. So while we we're developing the solution, we were also out there highlighting the problem. And that's a really important thing with every cause that we've done. You have to understand that Washington in particular, but I think policymakers in general, Washington in particular is reactive. They're not going to solve a problem that they don't know exists. So the first thing you have to do is prove that there's a problem. We spent the better part of a year or two proving that there was a problem. And once people were, were aware of that, once they were demanding a solution, well, that's where Secretary Ridge and our coalition stepped forward and handed them the outlines to TSA PreCheck on a silver platter. Now, all that said, just have to mention, none of it would have been possible without an administrator at TSA at the time, a gentleman by the name of John Pistol, who had the courage to try a different approach. Because let's face it, if you work at the Department of Homeland Security, you're not getting incentivized to move people faster. Mm. You're not getting incentivized to think about commerce. You're not getting incentivized to think about the traveler's experience. So it takes people with courage to realize we can be secure and also efficient. We can be secure and also be welcoming. Mm -hmm. And what I love about TSA PreCheck is it's a rare win, win, win. You don't find many of those. But if we just think about it for a minute, it is a win for the 35% of us who are now in TSA PreCheck, we get a better experience. It's a win for TSA who obtained more information about you, more information about me, more information about millions of others they didn't have. So now they're more informed. And it's a win for the 65% of travelers who are still in the regular line because they don't have us clogging up the lines too. Mm -hmm. So it's a win, win, win across the board. Feel great about that. Now we got to figure out how do we continue to grow it? 35%, how do we get to 40, 50, 60% of travelers in pre-check have more pre-check lines and have a more seamless experience? That's going to be one of our priorities going forward at US Travel. That's awesome. And thank you for that. 
Uh, you know, talking about courage, uh, I see that not only in association or, or, or uh, in Washington or in cooperation, I think there's a, a disease that people in general are thinking more about what if I say this or I do that, I might be fired instead of, is it good for my organization? Is it good for the community? And that's uh, unfortunately something I see in many different instances. But to come back to, to what you were doing with PreCheck, and um, I watched um, a, an interview that you had about eight months ago with uh, Richard Quest about the, the visa and the timing to get the visa. This is also impacting when people don't realize, as you rightly said, that we're competing with the entire world. If they don't come to the US, they will come somewhere else. They will spend their money somewhere else. So what is the issue right now? How do we stand with uh, the, the visa uh, application for people to come uh, and, uh, and have their meetings uh, in America? So when it comes to attracting international visitors to the United States, there's three elements. It's one part, getting permission to come into the country. It's one part, the entry experience. And it's one part, asking people for their business. Brand USA is the part that asks people for their business. It's out there marketing, encouraging people to come to the United States. The customs process is the process about getting into the country, process that is becoming, again, cumbersome, a process that's becoming discouraging to travelers. We're increasingly seeing waits of one, two plus hours at our customs checkpoints. A big reason for that is because while we're adding customs officers, we're sending nearly all of them to the southern border. So the airports are receiving very few additional officers, despite the demand in travel. What that means is a very inefficient experience, unless and until we embrace technological solutions at the airports. The truth is, I don't think we're going to get a lot more customs officials at the airports. We're going to have to find more ways to move people through a global entry-like experience mm -hmm. where they don't meet with officers. They do things from a technological standpoint, and that gets them into the country. So we've got a lot of work to do on customs. The other part is the part about giving people permission to come to the country. For 40-some percent of travelers around the world, coming to the U.S. requires them to get a visa. And the post-9-11 requirement is that to get that visa, you have to do a personal interview with a consular official somewhere in the world. Well, the problem is our consulates don't have enough people to keep up with the demand of those that want to get visas. Hmm. So what we've run into in places like Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, India, is wait times to get those interviews that exceed three, four, 500 days wow. to get an interview. Today, in Mexico, the wait time to get a visa interview is more than 700 days. Huh. What that means is you say, I want to come to the U.S. in more than two years. I'm going to go to the consulate uh, now to have my interview. Think of that. We're getting the 20, 2026 World Cup in a little over two years. These people from Colombia, Mexico, they need to be going to the consulate now to be able to come to the 2026 World Cup. It makes no sense. And what it does is send a message to travelers around the world that we don't want their business. So while we are operating in a completely inefficient manner, Canada, the UK, other markets are looking at our weaknesses and saying, you know what, if you're going to require a visa for Brazilians, and make them wait 400 days to get that interview, we are going to waive the visa requirement for those same travelers, and we're going to get them to come here rather than go see you. So that's the global competition that we're dealing with. Other countries, much more coordinated, much more strategic, they're going out and capturing our traveler. We don't tend to look at things in an integrated, coordinated way at a federal level in the United States. The Department of State handles visa. The Department of Homeland Security handles customs. The Department of Commerce handles commerce. But to get these things to work together and actually make the U.S. competitive is remarkably difficult. And we're seeing that right now with visas. We're not getting the travelers we need to be getting. We estimate the loss for the United States this year to be about $12 billion in travel spending that would have taken place here in the United States. We're, we know we're feeling it with meetings. When I talk to trade show organizers, what I hear is that they think they're down 10 plus percent because specifically of the international visitor that isn't able to attend. 
What policymakers don't always appreciate is that's not just affecting hotels and airlines and rental car companies. The most, to put it in, in the best context for me was what I heard from the American Dental Association. who said it's affecting us. It's affecting dentists because we can't get the right people into the country at the right events. And now to think this isn't a travel industry issue, it's a dental issue. It's an issue of consumer electronics at the upcoming show uh, in Las Vegas. It's, it's an issue of any industry that meets mm -hmm. and able to bring the brightest minds together. We're doing everything we can to work with the State Department here. The State Department has acknowledged the problem, and that is a step in the right direction. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done. It's absolutely unacceptable. We believe there should be a standard of no more than 30 days to get a visa interview. We got a long way to go to get to that point. Wow. I mean, I, I was not aware of that. And uh, I, I would imagine the majority of the public doesn't realize that. Um, I do remember when I was chair of the uh, International Board of MPI, uh, we had the first economic impact study for the meetings industry. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm not looking to, to be uh, sure of the number. We represent, I mean, we the, the U.S. travel and hospitality industry today represent $1.1 trillion, which is absolutely essential for uh, the economy and for uh, our communities. What do you think should be done, can be done for more people, obviously legislators, but also the general public, uh, to understand the impact of our economy? And maybe a segue to that would be to attract more people uh, to our industry. Yeah, you're, you're hitting on an important issue because we often talk about the economic impact. We talk about the more than trillion dollar uh, economic impact. We talk about the jobs, we talk about the wages, we talk about the tax revenue. But the truth is, it's not breaking through. It's not breaking through the way any of us want it to break through. How do I know that? Well, if travel was respected the way that we want it to be respected, we wouldn't have had 16-week waits this summer to get a passport to get out of the country. If travel was respected, we wouldn't have more than 20% of flights delayed or canceled. We wouldn't have six-month waits to get into global entry. We wouldn't have these visa program problems. We wouldn't have the fact, we wouldn't be looking at a pre-check problem or a, a TSA checkpoint that hasn't changed in 20 years other than pre-check. For the 65% of travelers that are going through the regular checkpoint, It hasn't changed since 9-11. If we really respected the travel industry, we would see change. We would see more effectiveness in these other areas. We would see a desire to solve problems. We're not breaking through. And we've got to ask ourselves, why aren't we breaking through? Because continuing to do the same thing and expecting a different outcome is obviously a recipe for failure here. In this country, anything with the word manufacturing next to it is for whatever reason deemed to be holy. It's deemed to be something that is noble. It's deemed to be something that we need to fight for. It's something that we need to protect. It's something that we value as a country. We talk about travel and suddenly policymakers talk about, well, low wage jobs, or they talk about some of these things being frivolous. We've got to figure out how we break through and change that mindset. Because in the absence of changing the mindset, two things happen. One, policymakers do you unintentional harm. There's nobody out there that dislikes the travel industry. There's nobody out there that's trying to screw the travel industry. What's worse, though, is they just don't think about it. They don't think about it when they put various policies in place. Let's face it, we, we saw that throughout COVID. If we're not thinking about the travel industry, policymakers are going to do unintentional harm at various points. The second part is, if they're not thinking about the travel industry and valuing the travel industry, it's going to make it that much harder to get them to do our bidding, to go get things done, to go fix the systems, to go put in place greater efficiencies. So how do we get that message across? Not just about the economic impact, the social impact, the community impact. You know, Just last week, Pew Charitable Trust put out data showing that those people who had traveled were much, much more likely to believe in the U.S.'s role in global affairs, to believe in the importance of protecting democracy around the world, mm -hmm. to believe in the various things that we stand for as a country. But how often do we talk about travel's role in doing that? You know, this summer I had an opportunity, first time ever, almost embarrassed to say at this age, my family and I went to Hawaii for the first time. 
And six weeks before the fires, we were in Lahaina. We were enjoying everything that that community had to offer. That experience makes me more interested in rebuilding that community, in protecting that community, in giving back to the people of that community. How often do we talk about that? How travel builds a connection, an appreciation that just makes us better humans, right? So we've got a lot of work to do when it comes to how do we prove that travel is absolutely essential. We need to figure out what will break through with policymakers, what will break through with opinion leaders, and then how do we tell that story day in and day out? At U.S. Travel, I'd like to see us spending five, six, ten million dollars a year on the research, the communications to prove the essential nature of this industry. And I think we as an industry need to understand that that is a cause in perpetuity because the moment we take our foot off the pedal is a moment that people are going to go back to taking this industry for granted. Absolutely. We've got to tell our story day in and day out, be zealots for what this industry is all about, do it in a way that resonates. And we got a long way to go on that front because what's, what we've been doing, as good as we feel about the industry, it's not breaking through the way any of us need it to. I fully agree. And that's what I've been uh, personally observing the, the last 10 years or so. It's uh, it sometimes feels that we, we're talking to ourselves, we're talking in a, a vacuum and not really making the impact. And to your point, policymakers are changing. And so it's an ongoing battle to, to inform people. And now, um, among all the, the things that you have to deal with, there's also the, the long-term FAA authorization that uh, you're looking at. What is exactly going on there and, and why should we care about this uh, FAA authorization? Well, I talked about it a minute ago. Uh, more than 20% of flights are delayed or canceled. The air travel experience is not one that many people uh, in our industry, let alone people who aren't in the travel industry, look forward to. We have in many respects failed the traveler with our air travel system. We're using antiquated technology. We, you know, The GPS we're using in our cars is more advanced than the... Uh, surface-to-air radar we're using to take off and land planes in this country, uh, which creates massive inefficiencies. So from a technology standpoint, from an infrastructure investment standpoint, we're selling the travelers short in a lot of these areas. When it comes to increasing travel, which is our job, we have to improve the process of getting from point A to point B. And a lot of that challenge falls specifically in the air travel experience. How do we ensure that more flights are not only on time, how do we ensure that uh, we're able to fly more planes, that the system can handle greater capacity? This summer, the FAA asked airlines to fly fewer planes into the Northeast Corridor, New York and Washington, because the FAA couldn't handle the demand. We have 1,200 fewer air traffic controllers today than we had 10 years ago. Yet demand to travel post-pandemic is greater than it was mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. We've got to address the staffing, we've got to address the technology, and we've got to address the infrastructure in order to make, you know, the travel industry is the heartbeat of commerce. In order to make this heart, you know, be able to pump the blood through the system, we've got to have an aviation system that works. Congress has been slow to make the investments necessary here. This didn't start this year. It's been going on for more than a decade. They've been very slow to make these necessary investments. And that's why I hope, I hope your listeners, I hope travelers in general will become much less accommodating, will become much more demanding, much more intolerant. I'd like to see travelers frustrated when these delays and cancellations happen with the government. It's very easy for us to pin, to blame the airline whose plane we're sitting on in that moment. But nine times out of 10, the problem comes back to air traffic control. The problem comes back to an FAA that is understaffed, underinvested, that is failing the traveler. And we as travelers need to demand more of government to go fix the aviation system, to build a world-class aviation system. That's what we're demanding. But I can't stress it enough. I, I often, it's almost like we've trained travelers to a degree to be sheep, to be tolerant of these inefficiencies. Right. If that's the case, we all just have to understand there's a consequence to that. And the consequence is fewer people traveling. If we as an industry are okay with that, I'm surprised, 
But if we even as an industry aren't okay with that, we've got to take a different tact. And becoming more demanding is a huge component of that. Awesome. Yeah. And and I love the way you're explaining it very clear. And also you you all has uh, all this data to support everything you say and hence the importance of research. Um, Jeff, I, I definitely want to be respecting of your time, but I, I cannot uh, end this uh, conversation without asking you about how you see the, the industry going. Uh, what, what I hear is, uh, is like revenge travel, uh, which is completely uh, crazy. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I hear uh, my, my colleagues in uh, hotels and meetings said that they're going back to level uh, pre-COVID. And in the meantime, I'm hearing people being concerned about the economy. So can you help us understand exactly, uh, get more clarity of where are we going? Yeah, so answering that question is a little bit more complicated because travel is not a monolith. Leisure travel is different than international inbound travel, is different than transient business and group travel. So I think we have to understand that. We all know that leisure travel has carried the industry for a long time. We got drunk on leisure travel coming out of the pandemic. But as I've learned, unfortunately, all those good parties come to an end and there's a headache afterwards most often. And I think we're, we're coming up on that headache right now because leisure travel is beginning to uh, flatline here. Flatline at a level higher than pre-pandemic. Travelers still willing to spend more than they did pre-pandemic. But if we really look at the numbers, when you adjust for inflation, right, we are in many respects below where we were, and I, I think I said 9-11, but below where we were pre-pandemic. And I think that's important to understand. Inflation, spending has been what's carrying the industry. We're hurting on the volume side. The volume is not where it needs to be. I think leisure will continue to be relatively strong. These travelers are resilient. We're seeing a newfound appreciation for travel over, over goods, which is uh, a positive for our industry. Now, let's look at international inbound. This year, international inbound, we expect visitation to be about 75%, 80% of what it was pre-pandemic. And we expect spending to be 75% or so of what it was pre-pandemic. A big reason for that, even with inflation, is we don't have the Chinese and Japanese visitors back to the United States. And that's where so much of that spending took place from. So we've still got a long way to go on the international side. When I look at group and transient business, both of those seem to have flatlined at about 80% of what they were pre-pandemic. It varies by market. Right? Some markets do better than others on the group side, but across the board, we're looking at about 80% of what it was. So the question is, how do we grow? Where, what does growth look like? Where does it come from? We've got work to do, obviously, to fix the aviation system. We've got work to do to fix the processes for international travelers. But specific to group, I think we've got work to do to convince decision makers of the ROI of these activities. And we need, I need some more research to back that up, but that would really make a difference. But the anecdotal evidence suggests that business leaders think they can send four people today when they used to send seven people, that they can skip this meeting and just do these two meetings over here. I think there is a question about ROI, and I think there is a demand for those of us in the group travel segment to prove the ROI. How do we demonstrate for these decision makers that putting these employees on the road will make a meaningful, measurable difference for your company, for your association, for whomever it's for? That's where I think we've got a lot of work to do. You know, where, where's the study from Harvard Business School or from Wharton that really speaks to the value of these activities? Mm. Where's the research that demonstrates that those companies that stayed on the road and in the market throughout the pandemic are doing better than those who were trenched during the pandemic, right? Where is the work that just serves as a tailwind for our industry that speaks to the value of these activities? Not enough of that work is out there today. I think that's an opportunity for U.S. travel. It's for that reason U.S. travel is doubling down on our focus on the group market. We just hired our first head of group travel. Ishma Hader is joining us from Visit Orlando. Prior to that, she was with Caesars for many years. Her job is to coalesce the group sector, 
focus in on the two to three things where we can make the most meaningful difference for the industry, and then work with the U.S. travel team and external resources to deliver on that agenda. But wake up every single day asking, how do I protect and grow the group market and lose sleep every night asking that same question? That's going to be U.S. travel's focus going forward. And I think it's a great opportunity for us. And I think it's going to deliver great results for the industry. That's awesome. I remember doing uh, in 2000 uh, the first uh, study on the impact of incentive trip with uh, one of our clients at that time. And the results were stunning. And I basically was using the data afterwards uh, as a sales uh, point. So th that was awesome. Here's a question then, Eric. That was 2000. We did it. Did we re-up it in 2002 and do it again in 2004, do it again in 2006? Did we find other allies who are more convincing to, than us to go and, and spout the value of that research? It goes back to what I said a few moments ago. This is an effort in perpetuity. We have to constantly prove the value. And the moment we take our foot off the pedal, we're going to go back to the situation we're in, which is underappreciated, un less understood, uh, and, and confronting more problems than we need to be confronting. We've got to be we've got to be zealots for this industry, and that's what we're going to be pushing for years to come. Absolutely, no, and, and that study actually with one of my clients in Belgium. And to your point, I should have definitely done that uh, again and again. Um, that that's absolutely right, um, Jeff. I just want to ask the last question uh, in the positive note, so looking at the future, and I cannot insist how much I'm uh, grateful that you're taking the time to speak with me today, and also. So impressed with your leadership and uh, leading with data, which is phenomenal. My question is, in one year, when we see each other face to face with a bottle of champagne, what are we going to celebrate? It's funny you ask that question. I just had my whole senior leadership team on a Zoom yesterday. And we said, okay, 12 months from now, what are the things we want to be talking about? Here are the things we're talking about today. What are the things we want to be talking about that we got done over the next 12 months? I think when you look at U.S. travel, it's particularly from your perspective, I think what you're going to see is a very defined agenda to protect and grow the group market. I think you're going to see the group segment with more oars in the water rowing in the same direction than we've seen in many years. And I think you're going to see some work underway, if not published, that gets out there and is championing the merits of this segment in a way that it hasn't been championed in recent years. So I think you're going to see real tangible evidence around the group market. That's, that's one thing I'm going to give you. The other thing I'm going to give you that I, I think the data suggests is going to be something that is resilient here, and it goes back to your point about being positive, the demand for travel is extraordinary. Coming out of the pandemic, we all seek experiences more than we did going into the pandemic. Yep. We seek interaction with other people more than we did going into the pandemic. I think that's going to be resilient. I think we're going to continue to see the travel industry thrive, irrespective of what may happen to the purchasing of, of goods and other types of services. What we're selling is what people want to buy, and that's something that should give us great confidence and optimism going forward. Jeff, thank you so much for spending time with me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in person. Thanks, Eric. Jeff, thank you so much for spending the time to speak with me today. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing for uh, our industry. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want to connect with me, please go on LinkedIn. If you enjoy this conversation and if you learn anything, please share it with your network. Thank you. Bye-bye.